Hi, everyone. It's great to be here again at Cyber Week. Uh, this is actually a panel, a panel we're moderating. So I'm going to call our panel members to the stage. So why are we doing this panel today? Why are we have all these amazing CISOs on stage today? Um, that is because the past you know, year and already going into this year, I think everybody understands what the world has been going through, how companies have been stretched thin to start moving everybody to the cloud, to kind of security trying to catch up with things. This has been tremendously difficult for CISOs and for all their supporting teams. And quite frankly, it was difficult for everybody. And CISOs' lives already looked like this where, you know, they live in a world where everything is burning at all times. And then it took you know, a, a shift and accelerated into even worse conditions. And CISOs had to start reckoning with, you know, attacks that have been accelerating all over the globe, supply chain attacks. We keep, you know, we call them the gifts that keep on giving. We keep hearing of more issues, more compromises, more ransomware attacks that have been rising from all these different breaches. And this, this is where CISOs are, you know, at the forefront with their teams trying to fight everything. And guess what? It's not like they got extra funding. They didn't get extra money to do this or extra staff or that they were even able to recruit anybody else. So their life has been really hard and really stressful. How is this going for CISOs? Surprise, unsurprisingly, rather, not great. CISOs are saying that expectations are becoming impossible to exceed or even achieve with you know, looming threats at all times. I mean, I'd say it's a heartburn thing for anybody in the security industry to have any kind of issue uh, with ransomware. There's, if somebody is gonna click on that, we're gonna be in a lot of trouble. 12% uh, of CISOs that spoke to Gartner recently said that they are able to exceed their management's expectations. Just 12% and just doing four things. That is leading the function, organizing security delivery, doing some governance, frameworks, you know, doing GRC, and influencing some strategic decision making. So that's not a lot of CISOs that are confident they're able to do their job. So today we have our panel of experts on stage and CISOs that have come to share with us how they have been dealing with the CISO struggle. I'm going to read the bios. One second. First CISO I'm going to introduce is Wendy Nather. I'm very excited to have her here on stage. She's like the superstar for me. Wendy leads the advisory CISO team at Cisco. She was previously the research director at the retail ISAC and research director of the information security practice at 451 Research. Wendy led IT security for the EMEA region of the investment banking division of Swiss Bank, which is today's UBS. She served as the CISO of Texas Education Agency. She was inducted into the InfraSecurity Europe uh, Hall of Fame this year in 21. She serves on the advisory board for Sightline Security, a senior cybersecurity fellow at the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law at the University of Texas, Austin. So welcome, Wendy. Our next uh, CISO is Andy Ellis, who today is operating partner at YL Ventures. Andy is the former CSO of Akamai Technologies. He's an advisor to Orca, Vulcan, Optics, and Grip. A graduate of MIT and former US Air Force officer, Andy's leadership helped propel Akamai from its start as a content delivery network into a powerhouse with a billion dollar dedicated cybersecurity business. In his 20 year tenure, Andy led Akamai's information security organization from a single individual to over 90 people on that security team, over 40% of which were women. Andy has received the Air Force Commendation Medal and was inducted into the CISO Hall of Fame as well this year in 21. Welcome, Andy. Next up, we have Moran Ashkenazi. She's the CISO at JFrog. She leads security as CISO and VP of Security Engineering. She has over 20 years of experience in cybersecurity with deep knowledge in strategy, architecture, and technical product management. She was previously the CISO of Platica, 
one of the largest social gaming companies in the world, where she established a cybersecurity vision and built a strong security department. She serves on the advisory boards of selected startups in the DevSecOps and cloud industry, where she brings her vast knowledge, passion, and experience to the table to help companies build security inside and out. Welcome, Moran. And last but not least, Shlomi Avivi. Shlomi is the CISO of First Digital Bank. He has over 15 years of experience in building and managing security organizations in high-risk situations and within regulated industries. Shlomi started his path with the IDF and has since worked with many of the biggest technology players based in Israel. Now with Israel First Digital Banks, Shlomi's diverse experience and deep understanding in the various aspects of security underpin his success driving security for this special new bank. Thank you, hi Shlomi. <laughs> As you can see, you are in great hands. <laughs> and so we're going to start directing our questions to this audience, to this panel. So 88% of CISOs that have been interviewed about stress levels have said that their stress level is too high, that they have physical um, phenomena from it and sicknesses and even mental issues for half of them. The average tenure of a CISO is just 26 months because of high stress and burnout. How do you, uh, dear panel, <laughs> deal with performance standards and the daily stresses of running security for your companies? Uh, Andy, please, can you start? Well, I, I think when I left Akamai, I brought the average tenure down by like one day across the whole industry, so sorry about that. Um, I think an important part of managing just stress in general is taking care of yourself first. And that's something executives are really bad at and security professionals are really bad at and security executives get the combination. And if you don't take care of yourself, then it's hard for you to take care of your team because they don't believe you when you say, look, take time off to worry about your own you know, health and your emotional well-being. So that's one thing is to recognize that if you don't have your own wellness, then every little stress pushes you a little bit farther and makes it a little bit harder for you to recover before the next thing. And we do go from fire to fire. Like, it's not like it's a job that you say, oh, I know what I'm doing today. Because you come in and you thought you were doing one thing and it turns out that you don't have any computers that work, so I guess you're dealing with ransomware today. Um, and you have to just sort of plan for that and recognize that your plans for the year are not what you're going to get done. And you don't take it that hard. Like, recognize that that's part of what's going to happen, and don't stress about what might have been. Moan, do you have something to add? Can you hear me? Okay. First, I don't think that the CISO position is just uh, for everybody, right? Uh, it's stressful, um, it's intense, and I think that I'm lucky that I born in Israel, and I'm doing cybersecurity for over 22 years. So I actually born into the, the stress, and that's the only thing that I'm familiar with. So there is no relax in my life from very beginning of my career. Um, I do think that planning is a very good, um, it's, it's a good start to just understand how to deal with your strategy, be familiar with the, with the company risks. Uh, not jump from one startup to another. It's very easy to go with the next trendy startup and, and move from, from one project to another. But be able to get familiar with the risks, manage it, uh, be very focused on delivery. It's something that really helps me, helps me and to manage the teams and the operations. And, and it's truly chaotic day. Every day is a chaotic day. So being an organized person, and uh, in that chaotic situation. And also, I think that in a matter of personality, you need to be a very strong person. Uh, it's not an easy task, and a lot of pressure from, from the board into the employees. And um, you, need, you, you need to take care of yourself. I truly uh, believe in that. Just, a lot of sports in my day are coming when I start the CISO positions. Um, and beside that, I truly think that when you're doing that role, uh, you need to explicitly get familiar with uh, the way you want to handle stuff and how you're going to do that. Be a very 
uh, sharp with your day life and your tasks and uh, get familiar with how you're going to operate that. Right, you have some sort of a response plan. Definitely. Wendy. Well, anybody who knows me know that, that I'm a big fan of humor, and I find that blowing off that kind of steam makes a huge difference. I've had discussions with my team that were, where we were laughing so loud that the CIO was banging on the wall next door to try to get us to quiet down. I have been known to put on an inflatable T-Rex dinosaur suit and go and give people their first hugs after the pandemic. And uh, so people just know that you never know what I'm going to do next. Good one. Show me. Yes, one. So uh, the way I see it, uh, the thing that uh, reduces stress the most is certainty. So as a CISO, you need to be on top of, of your game. You need to understand, like really understand what you're facing, what are your challenges, what are your strategies. Um, and not just you know, hover over it, but you re really need to understand it and, and know to the details. Uh, and if you do so, then, uh, then you have uh, more certainty and less uh, stress and less uh, uh, unknowns uh, in your role. And you can also um, shore, or share this uh, uh, certainty with your organization and, and reduce the stress with your management and your peers. Thank you. I think we got a few different opinions, and this is really good. Great, great answers. All right, our next question. So to truly succeed in their role, CISOs must clearly demonstrate their value to the business in dollars and cents. And that's going to mean shifting their branding to, from you know, just minimizing threats and vulnerabilities to also including you know, providing options for business enablements as they are you know, part of the business. So protecting companies from high impact attack can sometimes be all consuming because as Andy was saying, you come in and you find out something just happened. But there's so much more to a security program. How do you communicate the value of your security program when you're reporting to your boards? So I think an important thing to recognize is the role of a board. And the role of a board is to ensure that management has good governance in place. Right? The board isn't running the company. So you're not trying to communicate to the board to get more money. If you're doing that, there's so many problems in your company at that moment that you're the least of the issues. So they want to make sure that you are doing good governance. So that's what you're trying to communicate. And often we get into this trap of just reporting on what we're doing rather than reporting on what we know. And that's what the board wants to hear, that you have a comprehensive understanding of the business that you have a good handle on the risks to the business, and that you're mitigating the ones that are the most important. So one way to sometimes think about that is to communicate the risks that are endemic to the business, that you're not planning on changing, because it's just part of what you do. Like, you're in the market selling, and the sales organization talks about the risks to closing their deals, and you can talk about the risks in your business and why there's something else that's more important that you're working on. But it's really important to recognize that you're just trying to inform them and let them understand the decision-making process around cybersecurity risk. Following to what Andy said, I think uh, there are two important things to mention here. First, you need to have a very planned and, and uh, ready strategy of how the security um, in your company should look like, at least something that they can understand and uh, recognize. And the second thing that I, I truly think uh, it's important is being in a company that you don't need to explain why you need cybersecurity, okay? It's uh, also following what you just mentioned. It's just choose the right companies that actually understand why you are here and they really want to help you out. Uh, it's also a matter of, of the board and I can share that in JFrog, um, Again, maybe it's a, luckily that, uh, that the, the board of advisory actually l was looking for a CISO, for the right technical CISO. So I think it's super important to choose the right companies. And today is not just a matter of how much it costs, uh, how should I expand, how much money. It's, like, it's not insurance. It's not, we're not talking on those terminology anymore because it's either 
the company will stay in business and not how much I'm going to pay for, for cybersecurity. And it's cost. Of course, it's cost. I think the, the right CISA uh, is just need to manage the budget and understand how it's aligned with the risk. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really a matter of risk and how much you're going to pay for that uh, in order to just protect the business, to make them run fast and because we are in a crazy world, everything is changing. We are buying companies, and uh, we need to take risks. We need to take more and more risks, so we need to actually enable the business and, and be a partner of the business. Uh, give them the ability to take more risks, and you're their backup. Wendy. So one time the head of equities trading for a Swiss bank came up to me and said, if I plug this modem in, how much more insecure are we going to be? And I said, I don't know, five? It, 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 there's some things that are very, very hard to quantify, even if that's what the board wants to see. Uh, however, with some of the research that we've done with Cisco, together with the Scientia Institute, we've worked with CISOs to find out what other outcomes they wanted from their security program. And of course, not getting hacked is one. But there are plenty of other things, like minimizing unplanned work, and meeting compliance requirements, and recruiting and retaining talent. And these are all things that you can uh, using different metrics, you can get to measure and be able to describe how you're doing all of those things. So I find that breaking those things down and finding out which of those things are most important to the board can help you present the, the types of information that they're most interested in. So uh, I think that, uh, first of all, as I see so, uh, you must speak several languages. You need to speak technology with technology people. Uh, numbers with the finance people, business with the business people, and so on. But um, more specifically on how to communicate security risk, I think the methods that we all grew on of uh, estimating damage and probability, they don't work. They don't work because they are, in most cases, guesses, uh, but mostly because the linkage between a threat scenario and uh, a damage potential is a, is a weak link. So almost every threat scenario can result in almost every type of damage. So the way that I communicate with my management and my board um, is not using uh, these numbers and try to quantify it, but uh, describing the threat scenarios that we must, uh, uh, must protect for ourselves from um, and building it uh, in layers. So you can talk about the bottom line, but if there's a discussion and a challenge on, uh, on the way that you build it, you can you know, peel it off and just dive deeper. And from my experience, these become much more productive conversations than uh, that's just throwing a number and having the CFO challenge that number, and that's basically where it stops. Thank you. Excellent, excellent responses. Our third question. Cybersecurity study says that the solar wind attacks has cost affected companies an average of $12 million, and in some cases, about 11% of their revenue. Um, attacks are still emerging. Other companies are still reporting losses. There are cost of a data breach, a report that comes out of IBM every uh, end of July. And we're seeing costs really rising, especially during the pandemic. So cybersecurity and the supply chain spans the full breadth of the organizational ecosystem. What are some of the ways that you choose to mitigate risk in an area of collateral damage? Yeah, I think the third-party risk management space has failed us miserably. Uh, and that's partly our fault as security professionals. It became so important for us to ensure that none of our vendors repeated the mistakes of the past that we never looked at our own mistakes. So a vendor would come in, or you know, 10 vendors if you're doing an RFP, and you'd hand them each this checklist with 200 items on it that was the list of every failure any vendor had ever had. And as long as they said, yes, we have a control, you just said, great, we're good. And you didn't ask the important question, which is, what are we doing with you? So let's take SolarWinds as an example. How many people didn't even know SolarWinds was in their environment? And they're surprised when all of a sudden this, this system 
is a problem for them. And when you describe the system, it has root access on all of your servers and automatically updates. Like those words should just have caused anybody doing diligence to say, hey, wait a second. How, how do we make sure that we don't have this third party with root access on all of our machines? And when SolarWinds happened, every board said, you know, chase down SolarWinds in our supply chain. I remember getting you know, calls from our customers saying, do you use SolarWinds? And I'm sitting here, and I, I recall actually putting it on Twitter. I said, how many people are asking about SolarWinds, but they're going to get breached by the company that looks just like SolarWinds? And there's Kaseya that hits everybody shortly thereafter, which functionally is in the same space. And I think we don't understand what technologies we use and the risk that our use creates versus the risk that's endemic to that product. I agree. Juan? Can't agree with you more. And I would add to that, um, I'm splitting the question into two again. Uh, the first is just uh, the due diligence that you're doing and the initial step, so you need to be much more approachable, okay? And it needs to be something that every employee will be able to, to just jump in and, and say, hey, I'm going to use this and that software. Uh, is that okay? And get a very quick answer. And that's the first step, uh, which we're today doing it badly. Uh, of course, there, are, it's, uh, there is an advantage uh, if we are using technology in order to do diligence and, and try to run some estim estimations and assessments on those uh, third-party vendors. That's one thing that we need to be very improved because people want to download, they want to start the POC, they want to, to moving forward and do it fast. And if you will slow it down and say, okay, hold on, we are going to run an assessment. Uh, and it will can hold you on uh, within a month. You're just blocking the business, you're blocking them. They will try to do everything without you. That's one thing. Uh, so we need to improve in that and bring something fast, technology that will give very quick answer. It's good or it's not good. And what kind of permissions do you need? And what is the integration between the software? Is it something just on-prem, something slim, lean that you can do and just remove afterward? Or it's something intrusive into the systems, APIs to, to the business and, and the data of the customers, etc. So that for the uh, third-party vendors, which need to be improved for sure. Uh, the second is the third-party component, which is different, different story. That's the story of cyber, a cyber attack of the supply chain, um, the solar winds attack, and I think it starts with full visibility. And today, well, lack of visibility, a lot of companies and uh, my colleagues, um, you know, talk to me and, and said. What should we do in order to actually understand what third-party component we have in our code, in our systems? And, um, and it's not easy. It's a matter of process, of organization and, and culture change in trying to consolidate into a single source of, of truth. There is a long uh, article of, of the S-bomb and the, the cybersecurity that, that just they didn't just uh, send uh, the order. So I think we're going to see a lot of startups and companies that will focus on the visibility and uh, the due diligence of the code, the source code and the third party component that are going to do that. I can tell you that, of course, in, in JFrog it's easy because we're using our own artifactory, but it's, it's a half of the way to just get the full visibility first Everyone align. This is a single place of truth. Everything located on the same place, and you can have full visibility. So in order to ask, am I using those, that third-party component, or do I have critical vulnerability in place, and that CV, it's a click of a button. And I think that the entire industry will going to focus on that more and more. So start with visibility and collateral change. I agree. Thank you. Wendy. Well, I love your story about, you know, getting the right answer instead of a weak answer. Uh, I remember when Andy was at the helm of Akamai and when uh, customers would come and say, you know, we need a list of all of your controls, they would go, whomp, there it is. They'd have, you know, all the, all the documents right there. And just the fact that they could do that 
immediately raise the level of trust. And so I think what it really comes down to at the bottom of it is how much, what you require in order to explicitly trust your vendors. And I'm going to argue a little bit with Michal about what zero trust really is about. I don't think it's about not trusting. I think it's about being explicit about what you need in order to trust and what you trust them to do, what you don't trust them to do, and for how long you're going to trust them before you need to verify again. And so I think applying that model to your suppliers uh, is a really good way of trimming off the extra things that you really don't need to know and don't need to care about. If we all use the same template for the same types of risk for different businesses, we're going to end up doing a lot more work and putting them through a lot more work than is absolutely necessary. Um, adding to all that, I think there was a misperception about uh, supply chain or using vendors in the past because organizations used to look at it as this closed black box. We don't know what's going on in there. That's a vendor's rep responsibility and everything is good. But I think that obviously doesn't work anymore. And we need to start looking at uh, vendors uh, in supply chain as if it was our own technology. For example, if you um, implemented um, a few simple detection rules on the SolarWinds server, you would see that something, something wrong, wrong is happening there. It does things that on any other uh, technology component would trigger an alert. Um, but no one looked at it because it was the vendor's, you know, territory. So I think that um, uh, once you change this perception, then you can um, uh, you know, have prevention controls and detection controls and, and everything around it on your uh, supply chain uh, technology components, and that would reduce the risk uh, significantly. I agree, yes. We do have to you know, look at third-party components and things that we have in our systems with the risks that, the risk management that we have for our own technology. I agree with that. Thank you so much. All right, so our next question. There we have it. Cyber criminal love the advancements we make in technology because they are not translating into advancements in security and staffing. So the more we advance our security and we chase the next great thing and next innovation and moving more things to the cloud, the more places they have that they can target us. 70% of cybersecurity professionals claim that their organization is impacted by the cybersecurity skill shortage. And this is a very major thing for any security manager on any level, by the way. And it gets worse. You know, in security companies that say at IBM we have 8,000 security people, but when I talk to people in public sector, for example, they've been trying to hire for like a year and a half somebody who has some experience. That's, that's what they're struggling with. What do you do in your organizations to recruit, train, and also retain your security talent? So, I don't want to use profanity up here on stage, but this is one of those... You know, metrics that is awful and is horse manure. Um, the challenge is, is that what people are trying to hire are unicorn talent, right? They would like to have the security architect who will watch a pane of glass and write up coherent controls documentation and do threat research and publish white papers and totally go on sales calls as well. And they would like them at entry level pay. No wonder you can't find these people. They don't exist. They're very rare. And you only need somebody who can do everything if you're only gonna hire one person. That's not most companies. Most companies are hiring many, many people, but they're generally starting by saying, you should be a cybersecurity operator plus whatever your job is. But when you look around a company, there are jobs that are not operators. There are people who are compliance experts they don't ever have to deal with alerts. In fact, librarians make fantastic compliance experts. There are people who are content creators. They're writing white papers based on conversations with experts. They're gaining expertise themselves. That's journalists and public policy experts. So there's not a cybersecurity skills shortage. What there is is there's a gap between what the market can provide and what companies are looking to hire and companies need to figure out 
that what they want to hire is people who can do specific jobs, who can learn security. My 95 people at Akamai, for about half of them, it was their first security job. But we weren't hiring them at entry level. We were hiring them at mid-level, you know, insertion level jobs because they came with skills and talents that were useful to us and we could teach them security. Right, so you want to look for those transferable skills that they can bring in. Yes. Okay. Moran? Um, actually, if the question was here, I would say all of the above. Uh, I'm working on recruiting, I'm working hard to find talents, uh, train them, and after that, afterward just uh, keep them in my teams. It's, it's not an easy job, especially in Israel when the industry is huge and uh, it's like a candy land for a cybersecurity expert, especially for the talent, the one that we desire for. Um, so I think there are two things that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of. First, uh, really understand what, what I'm looking for and, and again, not just look for the cyber hero which will do everything. I don't believe it exists. But I do believe in versatile, in, in multidiscipline, and having like a passion for incident response, but being the best pen testers. And I think there is connection and collaboration between them. So I'm looking for talents which love what they're doing uh, for the first. Uh, um, that's their hobby. That's, they, they live and breathe cybersecurity. And from here, we can do a lot of stuff. So in my teams, we're dividing the team with uh, an experts, uh, the builders, the, the pioneers, the one that build up with me everything from, from scratch. And it's the, the second time that I'm running it. Um, and the new hire, which are the, the, the junior, the one that just have passion to cybersecurity, they're doing that for fun. And we take them and make them experts. And I can tell you that it's a, it's a success. They become expert very fast. A very young, uh, very young person that actually just started uh, with his hobby, doing that at night, become an expert within a year. So I think it's a, it's a balance between uh, a very high, you know, an experts and a junior with a great passion and and of course. Uh, capabilities, right? They need to, to know how to do the stuff and, and be very passionate with what they're doing. Uh, and also keep the people. Uh, it's, also, it's also something that you need to handle because uh, the opportunities in the market is huge and uh, they get a lot of uh, requests and, uh, and attempts, attempting, um, but they need to truly love the place their teams, they need to be the builders and build their secondary builder um, and be very open mind with what they can do. They need to, to have a place that first it's, it's their home and they're doing a lot of stuff and it's not just, you know, the, my position and that's my job. I, I'm, I'm having everything that I can. The, the sky is the limit and I'm not like locked within my, my position. So. You don't have to look for another, you know, additional place. You're changing position because something is not good enough, and you want to change. It's not good enough. So, give them the opportunity to be versatile. I think uh, it's super important, especially for the young, the young people. Important points. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, I don't think we have a skills problem. I think we have a vision problem. We can't see that the people around us are all potentially really good contributors to the security program. Uh, I, when I became a director at, um, at a Swiss bank, they gave me a personal assistant because that's what you got with a position. They hired somebody for me. I had no say in it. And as I worked with her, I realized she was very sharp, got things done. And I said, I don't need a PA. Uh, so I put her in charge of my access control group. And uh, now today she is the global lead for all the regional CISOs at Standard Chartered Bank. So there are people with potential everywhere. I think the problem is that everybody is looking to hire somebody exactly like the last person they had in the position. And sometimes it really enriches your, your capabilities if you hire somebody who is different. 
And as you were pointing out, we have to learn new things all the time. Everybody is new, learning new things all the time. What somebody did 10, you know, 15 years ago really doesn't matter that much anymore because the world has changed so much. So if you think of everybody as starting at the same starting line, figure out who you want to run along with you, who's really just good at running. And I guarantee you they will, you know, enrich your organization. Um, when I'm recruiting, I'm looking for um, talent, state of mind, and passion. These are the most critical three. Experience can be, uh, you know, uh, gained in time. Technology can be taught. Uh, state of mind, talent, and passion are, I think, the things that I'm looking for the person to bring from home. Um, and if you look at it this way, then, uh, as, as everything said here, you have a much bigger pool of people uh, to, uh, to look at and to, uh, to hire from. And you're not looking for this specific person who did this specific thing for these, um, this amount of years. You're looking for someone who could grow into the position. Uh, so that's the way I see it. Absolutely. I think passion has been mentioned here more than once, and that's, uh, I see it a lot in cybersecurity. And I agree, of course. Thank you for your replies. We have a little bit of time for a question from the audience, if there is one. So a Ken is asking, drugs. you heard? Oh. How, how do we keep our optimism? We've been in this business for so long, and it only gets worse. So how do these wonderful CISOs keep up their optimism? Uh, alcohol and drugs? No. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't do drugs. Go to school. Um, no, but seriously, uh, I, I think that um, in time, um, you learn how to think the way that your opponents think. And you learn how to, um, I would say, you, you develop a sense of smell. Like, you can smell where your problems are. You can smell what's the right thing to do. And it, it brings more confidence. And confidence brings optimism. Great answer. Yeah, sometimes um, you get to the point in this career, it's about five years in, where you start thinking, what's the point? And it happens to everybody at pretty much every level. And then you have to have a therapy session with another security person who says, no, don't worry, this is normal. Uh, I think part of it is we're always fighting against the, the binary absolutist uh, version of security that defines success is if you absolutely don't get hacked. If you have a breach, it's all over, you've lost. If this is not a perfect solution, it's terrible. And we should really be focusing on, are we making things better? Where are we improving things? Even just a little bit, uh, all day, every day. And so if you can go home and feel like, I've learned something, well, we just you know, squeeze this part of the balloon, we close this off, and now the adversary has to go somewhere else, and we can see it because they're going somewhere else, then we know we did something well. So we have to keep looking for all the good things. Indeed. I think I'm optimistic because of my teams. Uh, I'm actually, they're the one that give me the strength to move forward and, and do that incredible job of being a CISO. Um, and the second thing is just um, love what you're doing and, and know that every day that you are there, it's a much better than yesterday. Every day is a new advantage, a next step, a next step, step by step, doing a much better uh, cybersecurity prevention work. And, uh, and, and, and you can see that for the evolving of the plan and how it's like, it's a, it's a better, it's, in, it's increased. Uh, first, the awareness of employees and the feedback that you're getting and the fact that people come, they, they believe that you're their security body. They're, you're not like a policeman in the, in the office. You're their body. They look for answers and, and you need to stop them and say, okay, I, I cannot anymore. So you feel that you're doing a great job and that fills me in. I'm an optimist because we live in the greatest time in the history of humankind so far and tomorrow will be better, and the day after that will be better. And every one of the problems that we face is a problem that exists because of our success. Why is ransomware a problem? Because computers are really useful, and they help our businesses run in ways unimaginable to 
actually me, my, my teenage self, couldn't even imagine this world that we live in today. And it's amazing. And so every day that something bad happens, that bad happening is because something else good has happened and hopefully it will trigger another good thing. When you walk out through the startup pavilion, you'll notice all of those companies, many of them will fail, but the ones that are gonna be successful are also going to create problems for us because there'll be startups who made trade-offs to be able to succeed and we'll have to clean those, those issues up in five or 10 years and that's awesome because it means they change the world in a great way. Thank you. And this was a great question to uh, close the panel with. Thank you to our panel, to our guests today. Thank you, our audience, wherever you are today. And I hope to see you all in the gala.